The Coeur d'Alene labor strike of 1892 erupted in violence when labor union miners discovered they had been infiltrated by a Pinkerton agent who had routinely provided union information to the mine owners. The response to that violence, disastrous for the local miners' union, became the primary motivation for the formation of the Western Federation of Miners WFM the following year. Labor unrest continued after the 1892 strike, and surfaced again in the labor confrontation of 1899. <laughs> Background Shoshone County, Idaho area miners organized into several local unions during the 1880s. Mine owners responded by forming a mine owners association. In 1891, the Coeur d'Alene district shipped ore containing $4.9 million in lead, silver, and gold. The mine operators got into a dispute with the railroads which had raised rates for hauling ore. Mine operators also introduced hole boring machines into the mines. The new machines displaced single jack and double jack miners, forcing the men into new, lower paid jobs as trammers or muckers. Mine operators found a reduction in wages the easiest way to mitigate increased costs. After the machines were installed, the mine owners were going to pay the mine workers $3 to $3.50 per day, depending upon their specific jobs. P. 12 The operators also increased miners' work hours from 9 to 10 hours per day, with no corresponding increase in pay. The work week would be seven days long, with an occasional Sunday off for those who did not have pumping duty. The miners had other grievances, for example, high payments for room and board in company lodging, and check cashing fees at company saloons. Topic: <inaudible> Strike. <inaudible> in 1892, the miners declared a strike against the reduction of wages and the increase in work hours. The miners demanded that a living wage P. 12 of $3.50 per day be paid to every man working underground the common laborer as well as the skilled. In an era when many unions were AFL craft unions, in which skilled workers frequently looked after their own kind, this was an unusual circumstance approximately 3,000 higher paid miners standing up for 500 lower paid, in this case, common laborers. This principle of industrial unionism would animate Western hard rock miners for the next several decades. When the union miners walked out of the mines, mining company recruiters used deception to entice replacement workers to Coeur d'Alene during the strike. They advertised in Michigan, in some cases touting mining jobs in Montana, mentioning nothing about the strike. Guards were assigned to the trains that transported the men seeking work, and at least some of the workers felt they were in the custody of the guards. Soon every inbound train was filled with replacement workers. But groups of armed, striking miners would frequently meet them, and often persuaded the workers not to take the jobs during a strike. The silver mine owners responded by hiring Pinkertons and the Teal Detective Agency agents to infiltrate the union and suppress strike activity. Pinkertons and strong arm agents went into the district in large numbers. P. 12 Soon there was a significant private army available to protect new workers coming into the mines. For a time the struggle manifested as a war of words in the local newspapers, with mine owners and mine workers denouncing each other. There were incidents of brawling, and arrests for carrying weapons. Two mines settled and opened with union men, and these mine operators were ostracized by other mine owners who did not want the union. But two large mines, the Gem Mine and the Frisco Mine in Burke Canyon, were operating full scale. In July, a union miner was killed by mine guards, and the tension between strikers and strike breakers grew. Topic: <laughs> Charles Seringo. An undercover Pinkerton agent, soon to be well known lawman Charlie Seringo, had worked in the gem mine. Seringo used the alias C. Leon Allison to join the union, ingratiating himself by buying drinks and loaning money to his fellow miners. Seringo had been installed early enough to have been elected recording secretary, a key position for a labor spy, providing him with access to all of the union's books and records. According to Seringo, he had at first turned down the assignment, because his sympathies were with the Union. 
The Pinkerton agency agreed that he could withdraw from the assignment after B became familiar with the situation. But once he infiltrated the WFM, Seringo's sympathies switched. He wrote that the union leaders were, as a rule, a vicious, heartless gang of anarchists. In his later years, Seringo apologized for his work spying on Colorado coal miners, but he never regretted his informant role in the Corps d'Alene. Seringo promptly began to report all union business to his employers, allowing the mine owners to outmaneuver the miners on a number of occasions. Strikers planned to intercept a train of incoming replacement workers, so the mine owners dropped off them in an unexpected location. When the local union president, Oliver Hughes, ordered Seringo to remove a page from the union record book that recorded a conversation about possibly flooding the mines, the agent mailed that page to the Mine Owners Association MOA. Seringo also told his employer's clients what they wanted to hear, referring to union officials such as George Pettibone as Dangerous anarchists, Seringo was suspected as a spy when the MOA's newspaper, the Corps d'Alene Barbarian, began publishing union secrets. Although the union had advised the miners against violence, their anger at discovering the infiltration prompted them to seek a confrontation with the companies. Topic. Violence at the Frisco and Gem Mines On Sunday night, July 10, armed Union miners gathered on the hills above the Frisco mine. More Union miners were arriving from surrounding communities. Gunfire started at 5 a.m. on July 11, 1892, between armed strikers on the hillsides around the Helena Frisco mine, and guards and strikebreakers in the mill building. At first, the Union men fired their weapons only to frighten the men to leave the mines. But the guards and strikebreakers inside the mine and mill buildings were prepared, having been warned by Charlie Seringo. Both sides began shooting to kill. After three and a half hours of gunfire without casualties, miners on the hill above sent a bundle of dynamite down a sluice into the mill, destroying the building and crushing one of the strikebreakers. The rest of the strikebreakers in the wrecked Frisco mill surrendered, and were taken to the Union Hall as prisoners. After the Helena Frisco strikebreakers surrendered, the striking miners shifted to the gem mine, where a similar gunfight took place. The gem miners were well entrenched, but the gem management, fearing similar destruction of property as took place at the Frisco, ordered the men to surrender. Three union men, one company guard and one strikebreaker were killed by gunfire before the strikebreakers surrendered. At the end of the day, six men were dead, three on each side, and there were 150 strikebreakers and guards held prisoner in the union hall. They were put on a train and were told to leave the county. Minutes after the explosion at the Frisco mine, hundreds of miners converged on Seringo's boarding house. But Seringo sawed a hole in the floor, dropped through and covered the hole with a trunk, then crawled for half a block under a wooden boardwalk. Above him, he could hear Union men talking about the spy in their midst. Seringo escaped, and fled to the wooded hills above Burke Canyon Creek. On the evening of July 11, about 500 strikers left Gem by train to the Bunker Hill mine at Wardner. The Bunker Hill management was taken by surprise, and the strikers took possession of the ore mill during the night, and put a ton of explosive beneath it. The next morning they gave the manager the choice of discharging his non-union employees, or having his mill destroyed. He chose to get rid of the non-union workforce. While these men waited to board a boat at Coeur d'Alene Lake, there was another incident of gunfire, and at least 17 were wounded. More than a hundred of the men decided not to wait for the boat, and they hiked out of the area. The miners considered the battle over and the Union issued a statement deploring the unfortunate affair at Gem and Frisco. Funerals were Wednesday afternoon, July 13. Three Union men and two company men were buried. Topic. Martial law The governor declared martial law, and ordered in six companies of the Idaho National Guard to suppress insurrection and violence. Federal troops also arrived, and they confined 600 miners in bullpens without any hearings or formal charges. Some were later sent up 
for violating injunctions, others for obstructing the United States mail. P. 13 After the Guard and Federal troops secured the area, Seringo came out of the mountains to identify Union leaders, and those who had participated in the attacks on the Gem and Frisco mines. He wrote that for days he was busy putting unruly cattle in the bullpen. Seringo then returned to Denver. Military rule lasted for four months. One of the Union leaders, George Pettibone, was convicted of contempt of court and criminal conspiracy. Pettibone was sent to Detroit and held until a decision of the Supreme Court released him. The court concluded that the prisoners were held illegally. Union members held in jail in Boise, Idaho were also released. Thirteen under the court decision. Topic. Founding of the Western Federation of Miners On May 15, 1893, in Butte, Montana, the miners formed the Western Federation of Miners WFM as a direct result of their experiences in Coeur d'Alene. The WFM immediately called for outlawing the hiring of labor spies, but their demand was ignored. The WFM embraced the tradition that their organization was born in the Boise, Idaho, jail. Many years later, WFM Secretary Treasurer Bill Haywood stated at a convention of the United Mine Workers of America that the Western Federation of Miners are not ashamed of having been born in jail, because many great things and many good things have emanated from prison cells. Charlie Seringo was not the only agent to have infiltrated the Coeur d'Alene Miners Unions. In his book Big Trouble, author J. Anthony Lucas mentions that Teal Operative 53 had also infiltrated, and had been the Union Secretary at Wardner. One of the demands of the WFM's founding preamble was the prohibition of armed detectives. Coeur d'Alene miners engaged in another confrontation with mine owners in the Coeur d'Alene, Idaho Labor Confrontation of 1899. See also Bunker Hill Mine and Smelting Complex Coeur d'Alene, Idaho Labor Confrontation of 1899 Coeur d'Alene Miners Dispute Overview of both Coeur d'Alene Incidents Ed Boyce, WFM Leader Charlie Seringo, Pinkerton Agent, Labor Spy, and Hired Gunman George Pettibone, WFM Union supporter, later accused and acquitted of conspiracy to murder former Idaho Governor Stuenberg Labor spies Cripple Creek Miners' Strike of 1894, the WFM in Colorado Colorado Labor Wars of 1903–04 Murder of workers in labor disputes in the United States, 1905–1914